the tea kettle's a whistlin', Scott Atterbury's mother always used to say. The phrase meant it was time for action, that the wait was over. It passed through Scott's mind as he hung up the phone. A contact in Washington had just called to tell him a bill it would behoove the company to review was making its way to the floor in the next few days. The tea kettle's a whistlin', Scott thought as he sent details for an emergency meeting via group text. There were a few confidential documents he had to retrieve from the office before he could get on a train to D.C. There, he would convene with the rest of the lobby. Scott disdained the sleepless night ahead of him, but nights like this were why he made the big bucks. Scott's office was only a ten-minute subway ride from his high-rise. He only had to walk two blocks to the station. So late in the evening, he wouldn't have to worry about too many people in his way either. He left his penthouse carrying only one briefcase. He didn't plan on needing a change of clothes until he was back home. The sidewalk already glowed yellow below the street lamps. Scott stifled a yawn, but the pleasantly cool, damp air helped him wake up as he walked. He enjoyed what he assumed would be the last few minutes of introspective thought he would be allowed for the next 24 to 48 hours. Scott glanced at his watch while crossing the street to the station stairs and saw he had made it in six minutes. Good time, and he hadn't even begun to sweat beneath his suit. About to descend to the subway station, Scott's ears perked up. Muted grunts and scuffing shoes rapidly approached from a nearby alley. Then a clear voice commanded, Stop! I said stop! A man dressed in dirty street clothes appeared to teleport out of the alley. He collided with a parked car, then launched himself from it and started running towards Scott. Scott stepped back into the street to let the man pass. A police officer ran out of the alley in pursuit of the obviously much faster man. As Scott watched, the officer produced his taser and fired two probes into the fleeing man's back. He collapsed in spasms and shouted something incoherent. The only word Scott made out was heart. He rolled his eyes and prayed for blessings on the prison union's lobbyists. Scott reminded himself of his compressed schedule. The officer seemed to have a handle on things, and he surely had backup on the way. But then a third person emerged from the alley. He only looked 15 or 16 years old. Raising both hands to the teenager, gesturing his abstinence from the situation, Scott crossed the sidewalk. Hey! the teenager shouted. Scott froze. Thankfully, the kid wasn't looking at him. He was staring right past Scott at the officer, and his eyes reflected rage. The kid raised something with a trembling hand. Um, sir, Scott stammered. The teenager had drawn a small pistol from under his shirt. Scott kept his hands raised as he scampered toward the stairs. The officer turned and upon seeing the teenager's gun, drew his own. Both opened fire. Scott practically fell down the first seven steps before catching himself. Having been deafened by gun blasts, the rest of the firefight sounded muted and much further away than it was. Scott assumed neither combatant would walk away unscathed, but that was none of his concern. His concerns resided in Washington, and he could not afford to miss the next train. The lights seemed dimmer in the subway station than Scott was used to. He thought he might be coming down off adrenaline. The station also felt eerily quiet, perhaps due to temporary hearing loss, and, notably, Scott was the only person down there. He swiped his metro card at the turnstile, pushed through, and continued to his platform. All the way, he didn't see another soul. For how much he hated the usual human obstacles in the city, Scott was surprised by how much he wanted to see another person. There was something threatening about standing on that empty platform, staring into the dark tunnels on either side. Oi, a friendly voice alerted him. So there was somebody else down there after all. Scott ordinarily would have ignored anyone who tried talking to him, but he found this voice quite welcome. He turned, ready to ask this fellow traveler if he too had witnessed the violence above. 
But when Scott turned around and saw the man who had called to him, he had to pause. The voice did not belong to a fellow traveler, but to a young man in a red vest, sitting in an old ticket booth Scott couldn't remember ever seeing before. If it had always been there, it certainly hadn't been manned by anyone before. The attendant's uniform looked pristine. He was clean-shaven, clean in general, and had a welcoming face. Before he knew what he was doing, Scott approached the booth. Quiet night, he asked. The attendant smiled. Until now. Scott said, Well, if you're bored, I'm probably not the guy to cure it. Not unless you're interested in hearing the ins and outs of lobbying in Washington. Ooh, that does sound interesting, the cheery attendant replied. Too bad it doesn't matter. Excuse me? Scott asked, genuinely believing he had mistaken the attendant's patronizing tone. It doesn't matter, the attendant repeated. What you've done with your life, everything you've accomplished, none of it means anything. Well, that's a hefty accusation to lob from a ticket booth, don't you think? Scott leaned in, meaning to tag the attendant's name onto his sarcastic retort. The young man was wearing a name tag, but for some reason Scott found he could not read it. He could see all the letters, but somehow he could not make sense of them. They refused to arrange themselves into anything sensical. They seemed to dance around one another when he attempted to comprehend them. The attendant seemed unfazed by Scott's remark. He picked up a notepad and pen, wrote something, and set it down again. Scott ignored this, assuming the antic was meant to spark some sort of reaction from him. He would not give this young man the satisfaction. However, he did feel a strong desire to teach the attendant the error of thinking lobbyists' work didn't matter. Son, let me ask you something. Do you know how laws come to be in this country? Sure I do, he replied. Well, then you understand most things come to a vote, right? But how do our politicians decide which way to vote? Do they seem like the smartest, wisest people to you? That's not how I judge people, replied the attendant. Scott moved on. Politicians are useful idiots. The company I work for recognizes this and employs me to help the useful idiots make decisions that will benefit us. Us? The attendant asked. Us, yes. The company and everyone who works for it. What about your customers? The attendant followed up. The customers? Well, sure, they... Scott trailed off. The last time he had traveled overnight to Washington, it had been to kill a bill which would have capped the cost of a common pharmaceutical. He had teamed up with the insurance lobby to kill that bill, and won. In the end, though, the average consumer saw no change, not anyone with half-decent insurance anyway. Nothing negative, just a continuation of the status quo. The customers, the general public, they're not really paying attention to this stuff, Scott answered. If it affects them either way, they barely notice. So you've made peace with your own conscience, stated the attendant. Scott hated the philosophical expression on his young face. This know-it-all kid, probably studying social sciences in college to attain some worthless degree. I don't need to make peace with anything, Scott sneered. I've never done anything illegal. Says who? The useful idiots? Scott felt his rage boiling. He glanced around and noticed a security camera in the corner. He pointed to it and demanded, Is this some kind of setup? Is this one of those prank shows or something? I mean, where's everybody else? The attendant shrugged. Guess it might just be you tonight. I'll prepare your ticket. Ticket? Scott forgot his anger, exchanging it for confusion. No, no, I used my Metro card already. I've paid. The attendant busied himself with something out of Scott's sight, saying, Ah, but for this trip you will need a ticket, actually. But don't worry, there's no additional charge. I ride this train every day, young man. No one has ever asked to see a ticket. The attendant stopped to smile at Scott, displaying an almost paternal pity. Scott could have interpreted the expression as condescending, but he did not feel the attendant had meant it that way. The kid truly believed he knew something Scott did not, and in that dark, empty subway station, Scott felt a creeping suspicion he might be right. Not this train, the attendant said. Scott raised an eyebrow. Excuse me? Yes, this train. 
Did the lines change or something? I just rode this one earlier today. I used my card and I came to this platform just like always. So what's going on, buddy? The attendant seemed to forget Scott and went about preparing his ticket. Scott glanced at his watch. 8.07 p.m. The tea kettle's a whistling. He looked to the display board to see when the next train would arrive, but the sign was dark. Scott had never seen it turned off in all his years of riding the subway. What is going on tonight? He demanded rhetorically. Don't worry, your train should arrive at any minute, the attendant assured him. Here, I have your ticket. He slipped a piece of paper under the plexiglass, and Scott took it. He unfolded the vintage-style ticket and examined its blurry text. Like the attendant's name tag, most of the words on the ticket scrambled themselves between Scott's eyes and his brain. He wondered if he needed to see a doctor when he returned. He wondered if he had a tumor or something. Maybe the loud gunfire had rattled something loose. Hopefully it was nothing that would disrupt his trip. It would be truly embarrassing to travel all the way to Washington and discover he couldn't even read the bill he was supposed to fight. One word stood out clearly. It seemed to project itself, dominating Scott's awareness even while he was attempting to decode the rest of the text. This word, printed in all capital bold letters, was RETURN. So I need this for the trip back then? From down the tunnel in the direction from which Scott's train would be arriving, a woman moaned in agony. Her voice echoed repeatedly up the black tube, clear and chilling. It started low and breathy, then rose in pitch and intensity until it qualified as a scream. Did you hear that? Scott demanded. The attendant replied, you dropped your ticket. To hell with the ticket, there's somebody down there, we should do something. Down where? Down the tunnel, you moron. God, you've been useless to me. Where's your head tonight? The attendant smirked. Hmm, where's yours? Scott scoffed at this sarcasm, held his poise for effect, then stooped stiffly to pick up his ticket. He still could not make any sense of the text except return. The last echo of the woman's cries faded into silence. Not that you aren't good enough company, Scott said pausing to let his own sarcasm sink in. I don't mean to make it sound like I'm tired of being down here with you, but seriously, where is everybody? The attendant stood and leaned forward. He peered across the platform in both directions, then craned his neck to look at the stairs. With a shrug, he sat back down. There may be more along soon. Scott said, Great, well, I'll just wait for them over here then. He pointed aimlessly behind himself and walked in that direction. With his back to the attendant, he rolled his eyes and thought, this is why they're phasing them out with kiosks. He looked once more at his ticket, wondering why he needed the antiquated paper. Was the conductor going to come along tearing everyone's stubs? Would he have to wake up the junkie sleeping under the seats to check for a valid pass? Scott accidentally chuckled aloud. Another female scream, primal and desperate, reverberated through the tunnel. It made the back of Scott's neck prickle. He whipped around to see if the attendant had noticed this time, but the young man sat twisting a Rubik's Cube in total oblivion. You heard it that time, right? Scott called over to him. He wanted to be right. He wanted some confirmation he wasn't sick or crazy. The scream sounded so alarmingly clear to him when everything else still sounded muffled. It frustrated him that the attendant appeared to have no reaction whatsoever. Suddenly, the attendant ticked his head to the side and pinched his eyebrows together. He raised a finger to his ear. Scowling, Scott listened. Flat footsteps echoed from the direction of the concrete stairs. Two legs appeared in the wedge of the ceiling and steps. As their owner descended, Scott recognized the teenager from the shootout, and his dry mouth clicked open. The teenager's shirt was clinging to his body, laden with blood. Black and red stains were spattered down his jeans and over his shoes. Anyone who's lost that much blood should not be able to walk down a flight of stairs, Scott thought. 
He also realized the only way the teenager could have possibly walked away from the gunfight was if he had won. Maybe it was not his own blood he was wearing. You, you stay right there. We don't want any trouble. No, I need to make my train. I really need to make my train, Scott yelled, pointing up at the teenager. The teenager froze in place and looked around. An expression of complete bewilderment crossed his face, prompting Scott to wonder if he'd had his head rung up above. Where am I? The teenager asked. Where is everybody? I think I need... I think I need help. Right over here, friend, the attendant signaled. Step on up and I'll get you all sorted out. Scott stepped forward. No, no, I watched this kid shoot at a police officer. Under no circumstances can he board a train. If you help him, that's aiding and abetting. For all we know, he's a cop killer. You could go to... He stopped talking as he watched the teenager pull at his own shirt and slip his fingers through multiple holes in the front. Bullet holes. My God, he's hurt. Call 911. Get the cops here in an ambulance, Scott barked at the attendant. I'm not, though, the vacant teenager said. Scott replied, look at your shirt, kid. You're in shock. But the teenager lifted his shirt, revealing his unmarked torso. He bore not a single wound, nor one drop of blood on his skin. Somehow, not even the blood saturating his shirt had leaked through. After he covered himself again, he cocked his head at Scott. His eyes focused, growing clearer. He said, I saw you. Up there, I saw you. You were... His eyes expanded, and his color drained. Hey, friend, just come on over here. I'll get you squared away, the attendant repeated. This time, the teenager obeyed. He watched Scott warily as he walked past, and Scott watched him back. Once more, a woman's painful cry came from the tunnel. She sounded on the verge of death. Whatever was happening to her would be over soon. Scott yelled, There! Right there! At least one of you must have heard that! The teenager looked back and shook his head. The attendant shrugged. The teenager asked, Can you see that guy? And the attendant nodded. Come on! Scott yelled, turning back to the tunnel. Unintentionally, his voice echoed through the sinister tube. At wit's end, he purposely yelled into the blackness. What, is there an accident down the line? When's the damn train coming? So you'll just need your ticket, Scott heard the attendant say quietly. Yeah, about that. I don't have any money, man, the teenager replied. I don't have a card or anything either. I don't know how this works. Is that going to be... No worries, said the attendant. He slipped a ticket under the plexiglass. Scott hustled over to him. Hey, what's it say? He asked. The teenager ignored him. I'm talking to you, son. What's your ticket say? Scott repeated. This time, the teenager looked up, bewildered. Huh? Oh, it says... He went quiet again, face wrenched in confusion. Scott glanced at the attendant and hated the statue of amusement he saw there. Scott said, Here, does your ticket look like this too? He produced his own ticket, showing it to the bloody boy while maintaining a safe distance. The boy snatched the ticket from Scott's hand. Ah, the attendant protested, but the teenager ignored him as he compared the two tickets. Scott could see big, bold letters like the ones which spelled return on his ticket, also on the teenager's ticket, but he could not decipher them. Like the other words on his own ticket and the attendant's name tag, the letters simply would not arrange themselves in any recognizable order. It was the visual equivalent of being unable to recall a word that is, as they say, just on the tip of your tongue. Scott said, See, they're nonsense. I can't figure what to make of... Mine says onward. What's that mean? The teenager asked the attendant. Great question. But does it really matter? The attendant asked. He leaned forward, rolling his chair close to the plexiglass. The teenager turned his ticket so the attendant could read it. His eyebrows went up, and he nodded, saying, You're so young. Must have packed a lot into that short life, huh? I guess so, replied the teenager. 
I don't get to do much since I'm always helping my mom. She's got health stuff, but we don't have insurance. Uh, hold on a second. The attendant suddenly grew serious. Can I see that ticket again, please? The teenager slid the ticket back under the plexiglass. The attendant picked it up, studying it, then shook his head regretfully. I'm sorry I didn't notice this sooner, he said. Your ticket actually has a hold on it. What's that mean? Scott asked. Does mine? The teenager raised Scott's ticket to the glass, but the attendant didn't even glance at it. No, you're good to go. There's no holds on return tickets. It's all good, man. I don't need to go anywhere. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I mean, how did I even get here? The teenager asked as the attendant returned Scott's ticket. If you need a refresher, you shot a cop, Scott said. Oh. Oh, yeah. The teenager caught his blurry reflection on the plexiglass. He stared into his own eyes as if he didn't recognize them while his hands wandered over his bloody shirt. He found one of the holes and looked down at it. He probed through the hole with a finger, turning to Scott with eyes wide with panic that morphed into astonishment. Yo, he said. He pulled the ragged shirt over his head and dropped it onto the platform. The squelch it made turned Scott's stomach. The teenager looked over his whole body, saying, This isn't right, man. I shouldn't be this way. His arms dropped, and he stopped turning. He stooped to retrieve the bloody shirt, but stopped when his fingers clutched it. He muttered, Wait, Arthur. Turning to the attendant, he asked, Is he coming down here? My brother Arthur, is he? The attendant raised an eyebrow and looked toward the stairs. He gave a questioning glance at Scott, who had a much better view up to the next level. Nobody there, Scott replied. The teenager cried, Arthur! And charged toward the stairs with the shirt in his hand leaving a trail of dark droplets. He pounded up the stairs without slowing, then disappeared. What an idiot, Scott remarked. The attendant said, You think that about a lot of people, don't you? Scott chortled and crossed his arms. Well, sure, but that kid's just going to end up arrested. I watched the whole thing happen. This cop was trying to arrest a guy, and that kid just started blasting. It's hard to believe he's not dead. Scott stopped talking. He could feel his heartbeat pushing against the tension in his throat. Distantly, the teenager's voice reverberated. What's going on? Where am I? He came running back down the stairs and went straight to the ticket booth. There's a wall up there, he said. At the top of the stairs, it's like blocked, man. There's no way out. Yes, there is, Scott thought with a nervous glance at the black tunnel to his right. Then he noticed some threads protruding from under his lapel and lifted it up. The teenager said, I gotta get to my brother. This cop was going after him and I, I, see the cop started tasing him. Yeah, he tased him because he was running. It's not like he was gonna kill him. Scott shouted from anger sparked by denial as he witnessed the hole next to his breast pocket. No, man, you don't get it. That's the thing, the teenager replied. He shed a tear. Arthur's got a pacemaker. That cop might have killed him. If he would have hit him with that taser one more time, I had to do it. Scott unbuttoned his suit coat. His head swirled when he saw the wide red stain across his white undershirt which also bore a ragged hole directly beneath the one under his lapel. I had to stop him, the teenager wept. You got us both, Scott choked on the word, killed. His tongue wouldn't allow him to express his suspicion. No, realization allowed. Wait, say that again, said the attendant. Scott whispered, he got us, but the attendant cut him off. No, not you. Him. The teenager said, I knew it could go bad, but he was going to kill my brother. I really didn't know what else to do. Arthur gave me that gun in case anything went sideways, and it did, so I just... Did you realize you could lose your life? Did you act in willing sacrifice? The attendant asked. Well, yeah, man. I just didn't know what else to do. Stop saying that, 
Scott screamed without realizing he had to add extra force to his voice to compensate for a smooth roar coming from the tunnel. Finally, a train had arrived. There we go, Scott growled, impatiently turning towards it. Uh, that one's not for you, the attendant called out. But Scott ignored him and waited for the door which had just stopped in front of him to open. To the teenager, the attendant said, Looks like the hold has been lifted from your ticket. You're free to go. He slid the ticket bearing the word onward under the barrier. The teenager said, Lifted? How come? Wait, no, I can't go. I need to find my brother. The attendant replied, He's fine, trust me. He'll be on a different path now. Maybe he'll catch up to you. But hurry, you'll miss your train. No rush, Scott yelled over his shoulder. The damn doors won't open. Warily, the teenager approached the next door down with his ticket taut between his hands. The door opened instantly, and the teenager stepped on board. Then the door clattered shut behind him. No, wait, Scott yelled. But the otherwise empty train had already begun moving. It accelerated at an unbelievable speed and vanished into the next section of tunnel. Scott stood in stunned silence for a minute feeling abandoned and confused. Yours is coming from much further down the line, the attendant explained, unprovoked. But don't worry, it'll be here soon. The woman in the tunnel screamed again for much longer and more ferociously than before. Scott ignored her. The lobby was waiting. He had to sort out what was happening regarding himself. He couldn't waste any energy on the dying woman in the dark. He stormed back to the ticket booth and pulled away his suit coat, showing the attendant his wound. Do you see this, huh? Now I think I know what's going on here. I'm hallucinating, right? I got shot and now I'm in the back of an ambulance or at the hospital. They've got me on all sorts of painkillers, I bet. Probably some other stuff too. This is all a dream, a crazy, drug-induced vision, right? Isn't it? Do you still have your ticket? was the attendant's only reply. Yes, you obnoxious little good, because your train is here. Scott shut up and turned toward the tunnel. A brilliant light glowed deep within, growing steadily. The woman's shrill cries escalated in pain and intensity as the light grew. The tea kettle's a whistling. Scott felt himself drawn toward the glow. All at once he was not standing on the platform, waiting for the light to approach but moving toward it, floating, then sliding. Soon the light blinded him. He squeezed his eyes shut and clenched his fists. Still, the penetrating light burned his eyes. He screamed. He wailed. He cried. There he is, a strange voice said within the light. An enormous hand pushed on Scott's back and raised him into the air. He was placed on a soft, warm surface and felt another hand stroke his cheek. He's perfect, the most familiar voice in Scott's memory said. This voice was so terribly, so impossibly familiar that Scott opened his eyes with total disregard for the painful light. She was shrouded in an angelic haze. Scott squinted, then tried to open his eyes once more. Some of the haze faded away. His eyes adjusted, and he stared up into the tired and sweaty, but undeniably youthful face of his mother. You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate, like, review, or subscribe. For ad-free episodes and bonus Into the Woods episodes, become a patron with the link in the description. You can also support the show by buying merch. That link is also in the description below. To stay up to date, follow me on Instagram at The Warning Woods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening.